السلام علیکم مائی نیم از ارمغان انجم آئی ایم اے ریسرچ آفیسر ان ڈپارٹمنٹ آف آرتھوڈکس اینڈ پروسٹیٹک جی سی یونیورسٹی فیصل آباد ٹوڈے آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ڈسکس اباؤٹ دا پرنسپل آف فٹ اینڈ الائنمنٹ آف لوور لم آرتھوسس دس از دا فرسٹ پارٹ آف دا پریزنٹیشن اوور ویو فرسٹ از دا انٹروڈکشن آف دا ٹاپک دین آئی ول ڈیفائن واٹ از الائنمنٹ اینڈ فٹ واٹ آر دا آبجیکٹو آف پراپر الائنمنٹ اینڈ فٹ joint characteristic related to orthotic fit and alignment alignment in frontal plane and effect of male alignment in frontal plane introduction the construction and alignment of an orthosis cannot be based only on the condition of the disabled limb for which the orthosis is prescribed a functionally or structurally deficient limb must be considered as a part of the body as a whole so that proper alignment and fitting can be done Special attention must be given to the normal static and dynamic relationship of lower limb joint so that mechanical joint should be congruent with the normal anatomical joint. If these relationships are not taken into account during fitting and alignment, it may hinder the performance of the wearer and tend to increase the existing deformity. What do we mean by alignment and fit? Alignment deals with the angular relationship of the orthotic components to each other and to a reference line relating the orthosis to the body as a whole. While FET deals with the relationship between orthosis, anatomical landmarks and body contours. What are the objectives of proper alignment and FET? These are flat heel and sole contact of the shoes with the ground, anatomical mechanical joint congruency, horizontal orientation of joint axis conformity to anatomical contours and landmarks joint characteristics related to the orthotic fit and alignment the first joint is hip joint the hip joint is a ball and socket joint which permit universal motion of the lower limb it means that the motion of hip joint are three dimensional in nature providing flexion extension in sagittal plane abduction reduction in frontal plane internal and external rotation in transverse plane second joint is knee joint the knee joint is considered to be a polycentric joint which means that in addition to providing flexion and extension knee joint undergo gliding and sliding as well as rotation as femur not only flex with respect to the tibia but also translates forward from an extended to a flex position of the knee Moreover there is a transverse rotation of approximately 10 degrees of femur with respect to the tibia with the femur rotating internally as the knee joint move from a flex position to the extended position in normal standing the axis of both knee joints lies in the same plane and are perpendicular to the line of progression as shown in figure the third major joint is ankle joint due to the natural torsion of tibia The axis of ankle joint is rotated externally 20 to 30 degrees with respect to the knee axis as shown in figure. Tibial torsion is a developmental phenomena which increases from a minimal amount of 2 degrees in newborn babies to a permanent value of 20 to 30 degrees by the age of 7 years. This developmental adaptation places the ankle joint in the best position for the upright walking. Line of progression This term represents the direction in which we walk, which is a straight line as shown in figure below. Although it is a straight line, but as you can see in figure below, the center of gravity oscillates from side to side as we move forward. Hence, it is actually represents the summation of excursions of the center of gravity during locomotion. The externally rotated ankle joint axis is not perpendicular to the line of progression as shown in figure during the first half of stance phase. It is approximately perpendicular to a tangent or the path of center of gravity of the body as shown in figure which permits ankle joint to bend freely in the direction of motion of center of gravity from heel strike to mid stance phase of walking. Subtalar joint also known as talocalcaneal joint it performs three especially important functions which are in standing it permits medial lateral shifting of center of gravity 
while the foot retains flat heel and sole contact with the floor and permits the foot to adopt to uneven ground. During walking, it regulates the tension of plantar epineurosis as weight is shifted from heel to forward and absorbs shock. During flexion of the knee, it helps to compensate for the difference in alignment of ankle joint and knee joint as projected in transfer plane. Alignment in frontal plane A reference line is needed to relate the orthosis and the disabled limb to the body as a whole. In normal standing, with the base of approximately 4 inches between the center of heel, a vertical line divides the body into equal right and left halves as shown in figure. This line is mid-sagittal line, which bisects the space between the knee and ankle joints. Normally, the flexion and extension areas of hip, knee and ankle are essentially perpendicular to this mid-sagittal line. This line remains constant whether the limb is in normal alignment or deformed. So it can be used to relate the alignment of orthosis to the body as a whole, which is accomplished by orienting the shoes, the orthotic joints and the band perpendicular to this mid-sagittal line. As a result, the shoe will be flat on the floor and the joints will be parallel to each other as viewed in the frontal plane. Effects of malalignment in frontal plane If the shoes and the orthotic joints are not perpendicular to the mid reference line, the effects will be uneven floor contact resulting in unequal pressure distribution on the foot and possible callus formation. There will be rotation in subtalar and mid-tarsal joints. Later instability if the plantar surface of the shoes is not parallel to the floor. Decreased durability of the orthotic joint, shims, shearing effects an unequal wear of the joint surface will occur due to malalignment in the frontal plane. Thank you for listening.